This is Steve Zelser with Workweek, and we're talking with Ruth Needleman, with uh, a retired professor at University of Indiana, and she has been uh, a uh, first-hand participant in the struggle in Chile, the coup, why it took place, and the ramifications of that for Chile and for working people in the United States. And we're coming into the 49th anniversary of the Chilean coup. So we're going to look at the relevance of the uh, coup in Chile to what is taking place with the rise of fascism in the United States. So welcome, Ruth. There's so much to say about why what happened in Chile is something that we should know about and that it directly has affected us um, often in bad ways. Sometimes the good is not so good, but let me start by saying that what happened in Chile couldn't have happened if the United States was not directly overwhelmingly involved. And that along with that, the AFL-CIO was instrumental in destroying Chile's unions and replacing them with professional organizations that supported US corporations and who wanted to bring down Allende and were tied in with the counter-revolutionaries. And so our money, our resources were used to kill workers. Our own unions, some of them, not too many, were aware and fought it, very few. Some were aware and supported it in the name of fighting communism, which has been the target that has shaped the US labor movement into a fairly reactionary global force. And I hate to say that I love the labor movement. It's been part of my life. My father was a typesetter and was a union man. And uh, I work with the farm workers. I've taught labor studies for almost 40 years, but our unions were instrumental in overthrowing Allende so that US corporations, most of whom would not deal with unions in this country, could get back to exploiting the workers in Chile and taking all the money out of Chile when they took all their copper. And so we're involved, whether we wanna be or not. Now, the question really is, why is it relevant? You know, okay, so our government and even our unions did terrible things, but this is 2022. I think looking at the rise of fascism in Chile, which by the way, the design of it came from Kissinger. And so the design of it is being replayed right now in the United States. How do you bring fascism to power in a democracy? Remember, Chile was the most stable government in Latin America. They hadn't had coups and upright. I mean, it had been a stable democracy. People voted, they might like or dislike, but you know, the military was not in control. And we've never had a military takeover. Not that I think that's the probable thing that might happen here. But the important thing is that right-wing forces cannot destroy popular movements unless they can neutralize the middle sectors. In other words, if small business owners and professionals and engineers can see their interests as bringing down the autocracy or bringing down the powerful elite. But what happened in Chile, it was so structured, so well played out. And I'm afraid we're seeing it in this country. Let me begin. The first thing the US did was just tried to get a little push. That's like a military seizure. They had some isolated guy in the military, kill the chief of staff who supported Allende. It was a total blunder. It was a US coup attempt without any 
widespread Chilean support. Didn't work. Then they started to make a plan. You have to get the people on your side. And big corporations can't get the people on their side unless they change the playing field. So my favorite example has to do with El Mercurio, was the major right-wing newspaper. The president was a vice president of Pepsi-Cola in this country. He was a paper company. He not only made newspapers, he was the sole producer of toilet paper. And most middle sectors did not hate Allende when he came in. It took a plan, a lot of misinformation, but then a strategy. And so what they started doing was hoarding everything. The U.S. shipped nothing in, no spare parts, all this stuff. And in a way, this problem with getting our materials today is creating shortages, not unlike the ones we experienced. I mean, they're not as strategic yet, but that baby formula thing was pretty bad. And, um, but in Chile, what happened is the witch people had the black market they, and they, they produced the materials. And so they had everything they needed. The poor people had a popular basket. They got their cooking oil, they got their matches, they got their, you know, your, their basics. The middle sectors suffered. I was a middle sector because I was a, an outsider. And you would see a line and you would rush into that line hoping that maybe it was cooking oil because the whole time I was there, I think I mainly ate dulce de leche, which is a horribly sweet product that was always available. But you'd go in a grocery store, there'd be nothing on the shelves. The only day there were things on the shelf is when China sent in a huge shipment of pork and the upper classes wanted nothing to do with it. And they tried to convince the middle sectors that it was communist pork. So I ate pork for a while. But what that does is it angers all the middle sectors. You have pressure within the Allende government to take over more industries, to nationalize more. Well, then you're beginning to hit the national owners, what is sometimes known as the national bourgeoisie. The small capitalists, the people who could have gone either way, but they suffered the most. And what we're seeing now is a form of it because there's all these shortages. People are getting tired of all this. They're refusing to wear masks, but that too was, was not quite enough to bring fascism in. You need the Proud Boys. And the Proud Boys was major in Chile. It was called Fatherland and Liberty. And the CIA, A-Field, and the International Trade Secretariats completely funded it. And worse, they funded it through the National Association of Manufacturers. Where is the solidarity in that? But what that meant was the violence in the street begins to polarize people. People who are afraid of violence. And then there's a large group of people as there was in Chile who said no to civil war. We will not fight a civil war against the rich people. But the rich people were armed and were engaged in a counter revolution. They were fighting a civil war. And so if the other side says, no, we don't want anything to do with that, you're gonna have a problem. And I see that here. First of all, the violence does polarize people. You know, it takes the, the wannabe fascists and the wannabe corporados um, and they begin to build some unity sectors of the middle class because the middle class gets scared. Oh, you're coming into my suburb. Oh, you know, you're taking my access to um, my baby's food, or you're, you say I can't have it all for myself. <laughs> and this creates a different balance of forces among the classes. 
And so that was culminated in the October strike, which you can think of as say January 6th, <laughs> where you try to bring things to a halt. And it didn't work. And I talked about that earlier, why it didn't work. But then the next strategy after they failed in the work stoppage. Before we get on to the next point, let's talk about that work stoppage because when we think about strikes of what's a worker strike and another kind of strike, uh, there's a big difference. And most Americans are unaware. Although when the longshore workers were fighting for a contract in 1972, the employers, the capitalists, the bosses locked them out and they accused the workers of having a strike. But in actuality, right. it was the bosses who, yeah, who had a strike and nothing happened, of course, to the bosses. It's illegal, but they were not, yeah, not punished. Right. You know, they were not punished. Right. Well, the October, what they call, they call it a paro, a stoppage. And it's known as El Paro de Octubre, which is very important in Chilean history because it was the first nationwide effort of uh, the counter-revolution to overthrow Allende. And it involved bringing, I mean, already Kissinger had said, we're gonna bring this economy to a screeching halt. We're gonna starve Chile of everything. This was the internal counterpart because what they did was that they were truck owners. These were not Teamsters, just like these were, these were not rank and file people who cleaned the bank. They were bankers, the people who owned the banks. Gremio is a guild of owners. They're, they're called Gremio Empresarial. Empresa, I don't even know the English word, but it was the bosses unions. It's like the National Association of Manufacturers, uh, the commerce, the, all those business associations. And that's who was running the game. In order to scare people, they needed a burst of street violence because they really wanted to provoke the left. And so the kind of street violence we're seeing, oh, an FBI office attacked, an FBI person killed. Oh, there's a, people are bringing guns now. I go out to Hobart. Hinky dink, I don't want to insult it, but it's a small town, dominantly white. And um, I go out there to join a protest because the Unitarian Church put up a Black Lives Matter banner. And across the street from us were armed fascists and police. It's important to bring, to hurt the economy because when the economy screams, it's, I mean, poor people are used to being with nothing. Not that they should, but it's the middle class who wants those privileges. I used to be able to get in first. I used to have a seat reserved. I never had to worry. I mean, you couldn't get matches in Chile. So you couldn't turn on the stove. They didn't have stoves that lit automatically. No, you had to have a match to light the stove. And if you didn't have oil, you could barely cook an egg. And if you use that match, cool. It was, it was all over. Would you have a match for your cigarette? In the United States, you've had these truckers protests. That's right. And, and these are often truck owners because most companies treat truckers as independent contractors. An independent contractor is someone who does workers work and gets no benefits because the company makes them a self-employed person. And these were self-employed drivers. Self, just like here we have self-employed. And some of the truckers are though, I mean, they grew up in a labor movement that was pretty right wing. And so that too is kind of tied into why learning about Chile is so important because the misinformation that we are subject to here as they were subject to there plays an incredibly important role in the rise of fascism. Because what a lot of middle sectors see is deprivation. And they don't care about the workers, but they've always been better than the workers. They don't wanna be just like the workers. And so, um, but when that failed, the next step 
was um, to work towards a coup. And that's when they began organizing a whole strategy. And one of the places that it began, I mean, they thought there was an election in April. The right wing was convinced they'd get enough votes to get rid of Allende, but they didn't. So now we're into military solutions, but this is where the AFL-CIO created organization called Kuproch organized the miners at a very important mine to go on strike because they weren't getting a double bonus. Now, they're the highest paid workers in all of Chile. They were the most privileged workers. They got paid in dollars, not even escudos. And so Allende paid them in escudos and he was gonna take away the double bonus temporarily. And they were striking because of the attacks on workers. Now, mind you, even at the El Teniente and some of the main mines, majority of workers were working. Two kinds of workers in Chile, kind of similar here, though they take different form. Chilean law establishes two sectors, two levels of workers. One is called blue collar workers, obreros. The other is called empleados. Think of them, that sounded Italian. Think of them as white collar professional. And by law, they get paid better. By law, they get vacation better. By law, all these things. And so the fear that they would lose that special status helped that strike. But what that strike did was deprived Chile of more than $9 million in exchange because copper is their export. And it was a direct attack on the heart of the economy. Um, I and how did the AFL-CIO organize these strikes? Uh, I mean, they don't really organize strikes in this country. They're against strikes usually. They're trying to work with the bosses uh, to demobilize. This was a strike workers. against the government because the government had nationalized the copper companies. Now they had offered the copper companies compensation, but Anaconda and Kennecott and, and communications ITT, they didn't want a deal. They wanted control. So they funded the US government's campaign. They helped to fund the AFL-CIO's campaign to overthrow Allende so they could get their copper back. So when they couldn't, they tried everything they could to destroy Coop, the main confederation of workers. They couldn't do it. They couldn't take it over. They couldn't get a parallel confederation to do anything. So they decided to build alternative organizations rooted in the empleados, the engineers, the white collar, uh, the skilled trades, but above skilled trades, really, because it's more engineers. But they decided the next strategy to divide the workers wasn't to try to split them vertically into different organizations, to cut them horizontally. It's kind of like the construction trades opposing Standing Rock because oil means a job. And so you could get the, the construction trades to oppose indigenous movements over a job for a skilled worker. That's the kind of divisions they were doing in Chile. And it's really the preferred divisions here. Uh, although there's so many weaknesses uh, where wedge in this country uh, that, but they had them too. Really the whole movement that made fascism possible and is making it possible here is similar. Economy and chaos, people afraid for their jobs, people with inflation not being able to buy all the food they can or the milk they need. And it's very similar. And what that does is it moves people to vote more conservative. Because when they think radical, they don't think about 
the upper middle class women with the pots that they're banging in the street in Santiago. Um, so it, it's a very careful strategy to neutralize the middle sectors because, um, and it was a battle within the Unidad Popular because some organizations, including the MIR, which I supported a lot, but was outside the popular unity, uh, they were pushing more takeovers. Uh, and that's, it's a very tough question. Workers wanna control their factories. It's kind of like the CIO in the thirties, let's all take over the five and dime. Uh, but at a certain point, that scares the bejesus out of the middle class and the petty bourgeoisie and the store owners and people like that. And so all of that is in play. We need to study what happened there and to recognize it in the events that are going on here. Because Chile was basically a petri dish, a model for how to overthrow a, gov a democratic government. It's also a model for how to impose neoliberalism. And neoliberalism, people say, well, neoliberalism, neo, I mean, what do all these terms mean? Well, this is the easy one, because it means disguised as being liberal or progressive, what it really is, is radical Adam Smith. Adam Smith was an economist in 1850. He wrote The Wealth of Nations. And in it, he even says, the public sector should never be given to private corporations. <laughs> but anyhow, he wanted absolutely free markets. And there is no such thing as a free market when it's already completely dominated by an incredibly wealthy, less than 1% of the corporate world and of the, the world. The oligarchy in the United States, Elon Musk, you know, the billionaire Zuckerberg, yeah. the, the, the very, very wealthy in this country. It seems like the disparity of wealth is growing. In Don't capital. forget the Microsoft guy. Uh, Gates and Larry Ellison of uh, Oracle. I mean, these uh, truly billionaires uh, really, and many of them supported- They're wannabe uh, fascists. And they also have supported Trump to his attempted coup insurrection because they, they do not want a, a capitalist democracy. They believe that, that they should uh, control everything and not have any, any restraints on them. Now, in the United States, the growth of the right wing, the growth of the fascism is that communism is coming. That In fact, uh, they called Obama a communist and they, they call, Trump just called uh, Biden an enemy of the state and they accuse the Democratic Party of being socialist and communist. What is that all about? Anti-communism in practice in the Western hemisphere means you don't like the United States dominating everything. So if you are against the complete hegemony of US corporations and US government, you are seen as a communist. And therefore, they play it out as dictatorial, totalitarian communism versus democratic authoritarianism. Now the, the liberal or the Democratic Party are saying the FBI and the CIA will save us. I mean, in other words, there's a split in the capitalist class in the United States that they're in an international warfare. Yes, and that actually uh, was even true over Chile. I mean, the State Department was for a long time attacked by McCarthy, McCarthy and McCarthyism and creating all these splits and divides. And communists red baiting is often just targeting whoever is putting forward a progressive idea you don't like. And certainly in Latin America, the anti-communist campaign of the FLCIO was aimed against 90% of the entire working classes of each and every country in Latin America, Central America, and the Caribbean. And so we were waging a war to save the capitalism of the US corporations that were oppressing us. And when you interviewed the people from the AFL-CIO, AFL, uh, what were their, uh, what did they say? I mean, if they were supporting corporations overseas, supporting US- uh, Actually, uh, I, there's a, long quote from George Meany, where he's talking about, oh, of course we support corporations that don't recognize unions because 
we stand for the interests of the United States. I mean, it's always cast in terms of the national interest. And so he's very open. He said, we have no quarrel with capitalism. The only question there is, is how much do we get, end quote. And, but they all said things like that. And they all supported the US corporations and the board of Afield had the biggest corporate operators in Latin America. J. Peter Grace was on the board. I mean, there were slugs, corporate slugs on the board of Afield. And there was a very tight connection and it was forged during the Kissinger Nixon years, which is the Chile years, when all focus was on preventing Soviet spread through Cuba to Chile and from Chile, <gasps> who knows where. <laughs> Does that sound um, like Vietnam? Yeah, it's the it's the old um, domino effect. That the so the rise of fascism here uh, is relevant to um, the, is relevant to what happened in Chile. The issue of civil war, because that is a debate now in the United States. Yes. Uh, the MSNBC, some capitalists are saying there's a danger of civil war in the United States, and. The oh right wing, so the, the fascists have said, we are going to have a civil war. Get ready. We're going to have a civil war. So you have the fascists this are already fighting that class, that struggle. The Confederacy never died in the United States. This is the Confederacy and all of its uh, disgusting, fascistic, uh, inhumane, um, whatever. And it's the same, I mean, all these sub battles, oh, which statue can we take down? And which person do we get to celebrate? This is all an attempt to, I mean, they thought that they had taken care of blacks with Jim Crow. When that didn't work so well, they really worked hard on the drug war and mass incarceration. But that's being exposed and fought. So now what are they going to do? They can't send them to Panama. That was Lincoln's idea. And they probably can't send them back to Liberia. They got our number. They know who we are. <laughs> so anyhow, I think there's a lot of parallels and doesn't mean you can look at what happened in Chile and know what to do here. That's been a weakness of a lot of wonderful freedom fighters all over the world where we think we can take something that worked elsewhere and just try it here. Because not that the United States is different from all other countries, all countries are different from all other countries. And sometimes within a country, there are big differences. And so um, that's how I became, by the way, uh, a Paulo Freire, where in Chile, I saw the complexity of all these questions. And of course, Paulo Freire survived the military coup in Brazil. He was exiled. He was, he was teaching at Stanford. Um, I could have gone, except I was too young. <laughs> so we learned by seeing the forces, looking at our forces and doing an analysis that takes into account factors that we might not have thought of had we not looked at Chile's history. And the cost of this civil war in Chile and the successful coup organized by the United States and the AFL-CIO, what, what was the cost of Chile? Oh my God, hundreds and thousands of people died. And it's hard to talk about because they swept up tens of thousands of people into the national stadium. That's where they kill Victor Hada, the musician and crush his hands so he can't play. Um, they just murdered people on the street and in their apartments. They just swept people up and just murdered lots and lots of people. But then it became more systematic. They had already raided most of the factory strips and knew that they, had, that they hadn't found arms. And so that they weren't that armed and they weren't afraid of sending their military troops in. And so it was a, it was a quick coup, um, but hundreds and thousands died. Many were put into concentration camps and tortured. 
And of course, all of the torturers learned their trade at the School of the Americas or in Panama, where US military trained them in torture tactics so that we could watch them again when Bush was president. Um, so, so you're saying the United States was actively involved in actually training, not only for a coup, but torturing and murdering oh, yes. hundreds of thousands of people in Chile. They, uh, Afield, for example, shut down all its operations in Chile when Allende took power. But their students sent to the, what they called the monastery in Maryland um, increased by 400%. And uh, they didn't need union educators because they closed the program down in Chile. So they were able to funnel in agents of the CIA. They were able to bring in more ITS people and give them more money. It, it was, um, you know, a very effective plan. And was the AFL Seattle officials aware of exactly what was going on? Not everybody, even, I mean, one of the things that Joseph Polizzi made clear- And who is Joseph there, Polizzi? Joseph Polizzi is the guy who got thrown out of Afield because he suspected that things were not quite right. But he's not a bitter ex parte or whatever the term is. He went on and got a PhD and he was a professor at a university. He's a very credible person. And um, they got rid of him because he noted that, I mean, the major programs, the housing project, which is what they would use as their main bribe and intellect and intelligence gathering tool. It was run by Air Force and Navy military. It was not run by anybody who knew anything about housing and certainly not by a trade unionist. And so, um, God, the brainwashing was just so horrible. And I can't believe, I mean, I, I sadly read Liz Schuler's message today on Labor Day, and it's so upbeat. We have so much to celebrate. We are facing one of the darkest moments in recent history. And all of this wonderful organizing is going on mainly outside the AFL-CIO. And Labor Day is not to celebrate, it's to recommit to the struggle. Lady, get a life. It was a terrible message. It was out of, it was like, what world does she live in? It was well, Liz Schuler is part of uh, National Endowment for Democracy, yes. the Solidarity Center. What is the Solidarity apparatus. Center and, and what, what is this? It sounds like the Solidarity Center is similar to uh, AIFLD, that it works with these corporations. And the other differences. There are some differences. One was, I mentioned that interview with Bill Doherty, where he goes, aha, capitalism has changed its face and it's now known as neoliberalism and it's not nice to our workers. So we have to talk more about human rights. The Solidarity Center is totally based on human rights campaigns, but only in those countries that are US allies fighting communists or fighting anything progressive. I mean, so the Solidarity Center doesn't do as much of the dirty stuff and they may or may not be aware of it, but it's hard to believe that they don't know what the solidar what the A field did. I mean, they were very clear to me. Our job is to get rid of the unions that are anti-US hegemony. And we can do it in one of three ways. We can take it over, but that doesn't work. We can, um, uh, set up a new federation, and of course that didn't work, then what we can do is go in and divide it and destroy it, which was what worked. They went in and really uh, put an ax to the difference between empleados. It would be like 
totally separating the trades from the production workers and setting them literally at odds against each other. Um, so you pit one section of the working class against another section of the working class. Yeah. And that's, that helps to uh, undermine people's faith in unions. And um, it also weakens the middle sector's interest in joining with the divided working class. They will go where they have the most benefit. They are picket fence sitters. You can see by the way they squiggle. Um, and in Chile, they really did. And they did it again for the vote on the constitution. Now the constitution, you know, the vote was yesterday and 70 plus percent of the people voted against it. It was horrible. And it's probably because they basically wanted one step to socialism. There were a lot of things in there that a lot of people didn't like. And there were a lot of things in there that were totally misrepresented. That was uh, the, the, the reform of, of Chile uh, yeah. uh, from what was a dictatorship supported by the United States, Pinochet, and to try to, to restructure Chile. This was supposed to be the peaceful road to that reform. Yeah, constitution. it was another version of the peaceful road to socialism. And um, it was a big defeat for them. And I don't know um, what the conversation in Chile is today, although I've been trying to follow. Um, but bringing- but here, here, but here in the United States, the constitution seems, this capitalist constitution, um, seems like it's under attack by fascist elements who say that we need a different kind of rule. We should not follow the Constitution anymore. And Trump uh, said he tried and his supporters tried to stop the certification. I would say yes and no, Steve, because our Constitution, and I think the 1619 Project just nails it totally in the early chapters, our constitution was written mainly by white male slave owners from Virginia. And they carefully wrote a document to protect slavery and to protect elite rule. Remember the constitution, we didn't even get to elect the Senate or the president. And there were all these layers put in. I mean, what are we doing with this house that stands between our direct vote and the presidency? That's, what is that? That's autocracy, that's crazy. And it's because our constitution is embedded with elitist constructs. And so people who call themselves originalists are basically saying, hey, back to slavery. Let's have a civil war and go back to what made America great at the expense of its people. And if that's their position, doesn't that run counter to the majority of workers and people in the United States? Yes. It's like, Boy, did they blow it on abortion. They thought we pull this off in the Supreme Court and we've got the Congress wrapped up for next year. But women didn't like that. And a lot of men didn't like it. It was a horrendous, disgusting and strategically stupid mistake to go that far that fast. They had the support of people. They, they blew it. Well, Liz Schuller and, and the unions here, there have been no mobilization by the labor movement for yeah. reproductive rights. The unions have not wanted to confront those members who are opposed to reproductive rights. There's no That's political right. debate in the labor movement. What They're about the members the whose lives depend on reproductive rights? Aren't we half the world? Don't we hold up half the sky? But there hasn't been a debate in the AFL-CIO. Right, they won't allow it. They will not allow it because it's divisive. I live it in this. I mean, I live in Northwest Indiana that between steel workers, which has gone far to the right recently and the construction trades, they control it. The construction trades in Indiana don't allow blacks in. We, like I said, they're, they're doing a project in Gary right now, hundred million dollar project to replace lead pipes, huge workforce, not a single black person and not a single Gary 
resident is on the payroll. So all white workers in Gary replacing the all white workers who don't live in Gary working on a job in Gary for Gary and taking all of their overtime payments, which are humongous, out of the county with them. And uh, this building trades leadership support this. Are you saying that they support segregation in, in the trades? Uh, they wouldn't say that. Qualified people are welcome in the trades and we welcome them into our training programs. But we're not going to train the workers in, in Gary, Indiana large number of the blacks to do that. They work. actually moved most of their training programs into the suburbs. And, you know, even to get the special industrial degree from Ivy Tech that is in Gary, you have to go to Valpo, which is a Klan community. It was settled and controlled for decades by the Klan. Still has an enormous Klan presence. All those white Southerners who came up for jobs. And during this Standing Rock, struggle over the right of the Native Americans to oppose this pipeline. The building trades and Trumpka not only said that the pipeline should go through Native American lands, but also were, many of them were calling for the National Guard to be used against the Native American people. What, what is that about, that they would support the National Guard to crush the Native American people? There are very few words other than racism <laughs> that kind of gets at the heart of it. I mean, there's other factors. But we have to remember that this country is a, is a settler colony. The Aborigines are not us. There is no white Aborigine in the hemisphere. And so we live on a certain myth about immigrants being the founders of this country when what they were were the marauders. And um, it's so woven into our history. I mean, I remember how happy I was when, when um, what's his name, got elected president. Obama. Obama. Uh, but his inauguration speech, he thinks labor history begins after the American Revolution. Like there were no workers here before that. And he never talks about before the AFL, really. People don't talk about, they talk about immigrants forming unions and making our country great. And they totally ignore the fact that the continent was inhabited densely by um, another, uh, many peoples who had built towns, built roads, had created huge, vast holdings of agricultural land. Um, misinformation is key to the oppression of all of us who are working people and who are not filthy rich. And it's so important that that's why the media is often totally controlled by some of the wealthiest people and the most reactionary. And misinformation um, is what we're living through. Uh, and the AFL has its own incredible misinformation narrative uh, about itself. And, and what is that? That, um, that, workers, that workers in this country, especially the first unionized people, the plumbers, the electricians, organized craft unions and began to build what became a powerful labor movement. They don't start by saying, by constitution, we excluded women, by constitution, we excluded blacks, Latinx, indigenous. No, it was, we started the labor movement. No, they started the false one. They started the misinformation track of the labor movement. And for somebody like Doherty, who ran a field to say what we teach in Latin America is what we learned fighting the communists in the AFL and CIO. I mean, how useful is that? The State Department people, uh, at least two of the people he interviewed said point blank that the education vis-a-vis -vis trade unionism that AFL did had no application in Latin America, was a dead end, and if anything, maybe political bargaining 
but not company by company, where the whole country is controlled by US corporations. You know, and it's still a big issue, not one I often talk about, but our model of contract unionism has some flaws. Um, and I won't even go there. <laughs> well, this, this issue of business unionism, I mean, the AFL-CIO formation came uh, in, in the post-war period, a period in which the United States was dominant uh, with the world and won the war, all the gold was here, and it controlled good parts of the world. The U.S. empire at the end of the Second World War was at its height, and the AFL-CIO was also, wasn't an alliance of not just the unions, those craft unions like the plumbers and other unions, but the, the bosses who wanted the AFL-CIO and wow. had supported a purge, an anti-communist purge in the unions in the United States with the government and with these unions and corporations. The AFL started that in 1905 when they set up this national federation, civic federation was called, made up of business, government, and labor. And the labor was the skilled trades, only Meany and, you know, were his predecessor. And the AFL in its constitution didn't allow women, blacks, and others into the organization. And they could, the people that wanted to build a more inclusive labor movement tried working inside the AFL, but they got crushed. So they left and formed the CIO. But we have to remember that when the CIO rejoined the AFL, I think it's 1953 or four, when they joined back together, um, they had already expelled under the Taft-Hartley in 1949, um, 13 unions and 11 million workers from the ranks. That's the CIO. And so um, there's not a good guy, bad guy, because this struggle in the UAW was an example because they really wanted to get rid of the left-leaning leadership of the UAW. And uh, I believe it was in the convention in the early 60s in Atlanta, Georgia, where delegates from the South wore Ku Klux Klan uniforms. Yes, I read that in the archives of the UAW. Yes, I mean, they wanted to get rid of the commies. And, um, and, and this, uh, there was a dispute, I mean, Ruther, Ruther was uh, against some of the foreign policy of uh, uh, Meany. What was Victor, all that all about? Victor Ruther had kind of a legacy of left radicalism I mean, both he and his brother had gone to the Soviet Union and worked there, but he was a little bit more people oriented than Walter. Walter saw the sky and wanted to be in charge. Victor um, started to expose the UAW. And I think the first time he did it, I just happened to be present, was at um, an anniversary Flint reunion of the sit-down strikers. And this would have to be, oh my God, in the late 1970s. And he gave his first speech, Victor did there, about the corruption of UAW leadership and the fact that they were in bed with management. And he started to be very controversial. I'm surprised he lived through it. Um, but he still was loyal to his brother. And, um, but he was a big support of the women's brigade. You know, there, there had been back in the thirties, this wonderful sisterhood of women activists uh, featured in Babies and Banners that really played a decisive role in the 1937 sit-in in Flint. They were, they were critical in, in fighting off the police. Oh, yeah. The women. So the women yeah, they, played. A they had, they used socks and they put in bars of nap, 
naps the soap, which weighs 10 tons, right? And they did like they did like this and they broke the windows with the naphtha. I was really close to Nellie for a long time. Uh, she, she was one of the lieutenants of the Women's Emergency Brigade. Um, and they were fighters and they saw the problems and the UAW never showed up to these Flint reunions, never. He was the only person from the UAW, Victor, who ever showed up in any of them. Well, this, this real history of the working class in this country, like the UAW, where there's an internal struggle now, there's an election, uh, most UAW members have really no understanding of the history of their own union and the leadership apparently don't want them to have that history. No, try, that... Showing, try showing some of these films about the history. They, they you know, um, the steel workers, uh, when this woman wrote a book on women in steel, that wasn't the name of it. Um, they praised it and they sold it at their conventions. My book, Black Freedom Fighters in Steel, they don't even have a copy of it. <laughs> because my overall orientation does expose some grave weaknesses in the Steelworkers Union, as should have, you know, the one on women. But that, that was slightly different situation because uh, the Canadian women were much more organized in steel than the US ones. And they were, they were somewhat radical. That's, I mean, this is uh, important in relationship to the rise of fascism because when you look at the United States and the threat of a fascist coup and, and a fascist, that for the blacks, for women, that is a, a radical, situation. Uh, you, and we're not talking about small numbers. The black working class in the United States is very, very powerful. Uh, in urban areas and others, women are very, very powerful if they act collectively. So is there a concern uh, of the capitalist class, the oligarchy, that in the rise to fascism in this country, they'll agitate and radicalize many millions of workers who can fight back and have the power to fight back? And now we come back to Chile because it sheds light on this situation because the movements were building in Chile, but because of their particular situation with the government to end the October strike, the government brings the military into the government, brings Pinochet himself into the government. And you but, say that was supported by the Communist Party in Chile? Yes, it was. The Socialist Party was a little bit more ambivalent. Mapu didn't like it. Um, and of course, Muir opposed it, but they were standing outside. And the argument of Allende of why he supported bringing Pinochet- There would have been a military coup if we hadn't made a concession to the military. And he may be right. The thing that's difficult about easy conclusions is we really don't know because it's so complicated. There were many factors. And it's like, was there a peaceful road to socialism? I feel pretty confident at that time saying no. Was um, Allende totally wrong in making that concession? I think he went too far. I think um, he, there was not enough that controlled Pinochet when he was brought into the government and just allowed him to do more planning. And there was no evidence that he was a neutral factor really. Um, so it's complicated. It's very complicated, but I do think that what years of repression unleashed were these unbelievable powerful social movements beginning in the nineties in Chile. And certainly in the last decade, what brought down the right-wing government, what set the stage for a new constitution and what elected a progressive Boric to presidency were, it was the labor movement, it was the women's movement, the indigenous movement, and um, they were very, very powerful um, and very important. And 
which means to say uh, that it wasn't the official labor movement controlled by you know, the government and the government's constitution. But in this country, there is this enormous mobilization of workers not yet in unions, of indigenous, of uh, black and brown, I don't know how, and Asian and certainly indigenous. These movements alone can prevent fascism. Well, how and, would they do that? Well, that's the hard question. Um, the left in this country does have a little bit of a history of sectarianism and drawing lines of demarcation in such a way that you couldn't step in any direction. <laughs> we really have to explore um, building communities locally, uh, doing a lot more of our political focus on community-based and local-based um, movement building. And uh, there's a lot to be learned from Paulo Freire about how to do that work because the organizers in Chile, in Brazil, in Bolivia, who came back from fascism and military dictatorship, those movements had learned something about uniting and how to do it and how to build coalitions that don't require that everybody agrees with everything you think. This rise of, of fascism in Chile, they were talking about a civil war. What were the different solutions there? Because in the United States, as you say, Liz Schuler and the AFL-CIO don't even want to discuss the danger of fascism. And their solution seems to be support Biden and support the Democrats. And that's how we're going to stop fascism. Allende. In many ways, that was Allende's approach. Because what started to happen as the uh, organizations in the industrial strips, the organizations in the um, poor, uh, poor neighborhoods, in the occupied neighborhoods, um, the, they were all beginning to get ready for a civil war to fight the right. And Allende thought that they had to rely more on their government himself. And many of his speeches, and you can hear them in a lot of the films like the Patricio Guzman made, um, that he's arguing that you have to build a power not apart from the popular unity, but with the popular unity. But the popular unity was controlled by the Congress, the military, and not by the people. And um, I don't know there there was a solution. I don't know if they had armed the workers, if we wouldn't have even more dead and tortured. Um, and so it's very, you can't second guess uh, because we'll never know the answers to those questions. And but the, the working class, though, the mass of workers were not prepared for a military coup, though. No, they wanted to prepare. You, you see these films where the workers are arguing that we need our own army. And they say in these big demonstrations, uh, you know, power to the people. We need a people's army. I mean, this, these are the slogans. And you get the voice of Allende saying, uh, but you have to work with the government. And the government is being pushed by Pinochet to totally strip the organization from the workers, not only the arms, but even the organization. And there are those who say, we have to rely on Biden and the Democrats to stop us from the rise of fascism. They Can won't stop us. They will do exactly what they've done in Germany. They will open the door to fascism. Oh, excuse me, I'll get out of your way. I, I think what I'll do is start a war over in China so that you're not thinking about fascism. And then as we start getting slaughtered everywhere, I, I mean, it's just crazy because Biden is uh, not going to challenge 
um, capitalism. He loves it. And he and the Demo most of the Democrats do not in any way understand the degree to which they are selling the people out in this country. But that's what they're doing and they're doing it in public. I mean, we made a great deal with the guy in West Virginia and now they can do even more digging for fuel, even more putrefaction of the environment. I mean, this stuff is crazy. Has, have the Democrats ever made an alliance to the left? They don't even go to the center most of the time because they're always trying to appease the, the part of the Republican party that doesn't like Trump. <laughs> and different from Chile, Chile was not the head of an imperial empire. The United States is a, an imperial empire surrounding China, surrounding Russia and moving towards world war. Isn't the internecine warfare in the United States among the capitalist class and the growing rise of, a, of fascism a threat to the ability of the United States to operate as an imperial empire? Well, I, I, would, hope, I would hope that we can uh, have some victories because, I mean, I just, I feel like when I see what's happening in this country that I'm watching Patricio Guzman's film on the rise of the bourgeoisie in Chile. It, it's, I mean, you watch it and it's just mind boggling because it sets off so many bells. And at the same time, their movements provide us with some understanding. I think they might've blown the coalition building on the actual writing of the constitution, but you have to keep the middle sectors on your side. Uh, or the right wing will get them. It's all a question of what the, the term in Chile was always the balance of forces. They would talk about this juncture and what the balance of force, the people who lived in the ghettos talk this way. Everybody in Chile had this political vocabulary that on a daily basis just stopped me point blank. I couldn't believe the understanding of people around me. And the United States uh, used to have a workers' movement. We haven't had it since the 30s and 40s. There used to be general strikes. There was a general strike in San Francisco, general strike in Minneapolis, many, many general strikes, you know, um, uh, worker occupations. There was a mass workers' movement, which we haven't seen in my lifetime uh, in the United States. And this decline of, of U.S. capitalism, the attack on the working class, uh, will uh, likely lead to a workers' movement in the United States, a mass workers' movement. Um, the what will happen when that takes place? Because the trade union leadership, uh, the trade union bureaucracy, the AFL-CIO, are opposed to general strikes. Uh, they do not want even a general strike against an attempted coup or insurrection. The Vermont AFL-CIO, David Van Dusen, learned that when they introduced a resolution and passed it by the state of uh, Vermont AFL-CIO that there should be a general strike in, against a coup and insurrection. I mean, for the AFL-CIO, Richard Trump could to rule that out of order. And you can't discuss taking mass worker action to prevent a coup and an insurrection in the United States is quite a telling statement. And he said that in a, in a statement that the reason that they ruled that out of order is they were worried that Trump would have used that as a pretext to impose martial law if there was discussion of a general strike in the United States against his- He could have imposed martial law, he would have, but he couldn't get enough military on his side. All he had were, you know, uh, crazies. And, um, but I still think a lot has to depend on um, middle sectors. We have, I mean, if you look at our labor unions, we have a stratum that is not inclusive, does not, wouldn't even, I mean, our AFL-CIO in Northwest Indiana would not come out and support our protests at the airport because they said it was too divisive. 
because they have members who support them, just like they have members who love abortion, who think abortion should be illegal, just like they have members who think Blacks shouldn't be in the workplace. How far will the AFL go to appease the people that it educated to be traitors? Well, the AFL Seattle has closed down its education department, uh, and yet they have money for the Democrats. They give millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to the Democratic politicians. There is very little education on the history of the United States. I mean, labor studies programs don't get funding from the labor movement in the a kind of amount of money that the Democrats get, the politicians get. It seems there's a, a fear of real labor education because of the danger that that would be to the working class, their political development. During the um, Iraq war, I remember a convention where Charlie Richardson put up a huge picture of his son who was fighting in that war um, when when John Sweeney spoke and challenged him from the floor about leading our workers and their children to death by not opposing what was going on. And then it led to a discussion of the role of labor education. And his answer was the role of labor education is to support what unions are doing in contract and in organizing and in member development, period. So I would say that that's a very- no connecting uh, dots. No talking about internationalism. Forget about the IWW, it never existed. And the CIO, well, you know, um, they joined us back and they're happy. I mean, it's, it's it's really a struggle against ignorance in our country, a struggle against belief systems that might have made sense. Remember that a lot of workers in the upper echelons of the labor movement were able to get such incredibly good pay and benefits because their companies were exploiting the workers of Latin America and Mexico. If you pay a Brazilian worker 50 cents an hour, you can afford to give auto workers in the United States 13 weeks of vacation. Where did that come from? That came from the exploitation of workers overseas because they wouldn't have done it otherwise. That was their stake. They had a stake in the oppression of workers outside the country because money that companies saved they could fight for at the bargaining table in the United States. Well, now with American companies uh, producing more in China, for example, General Motors produces more cars in China than in the United States. Mexico has been a major uh, uh, industrial uh, country for automobiles. A uh, large number of uh, U.S. and European Japanese companies mm -hmm. in, in Mexico producing automobiles. It seems the issue of internationalism for the American working class is a life and death question. Yeah. Uh, a growing question of how workers are gonna survive here. Leadership blocks us from doing that education, right? That's why people like you have to run for office. <laughs> so the, the, the recent uh, UAW convention, the leadership of the UAW refused to invite the workers in Mexico at the General Motors plant, Saleo, yeah. uh, India, to the convention. Uh, yet those workers who make trucks, General Motors trucks that are made in Fort Wayne, Indiana, <laughs> the same trucks. Mm -hmm. It seems that the, the need for international links, direct international links between workers in the United States, workers in Mexico, workers all over the world are the only solution in, in fighting these multinationals. There was a, an important moment in steel as well when the steel workers reached out to the Mexican unions, especially the metal workers. Uh, they protected the president who was going to be jailed and got him out of Mexico into Canada. And they were sending, in this district, they were sending workers to Mexico to see and meet with workers at the plants there. I interviewed 
I think I wrote an article on it too, UAW Solidarity, but anyhow, no, Steelworkers. Um, what they said when they came back was, it was so different. It was so incredible. They really did practice brotherhood, sisterhood. They really did, um, one person said he felt like he was walking on air because the union hall was so sacred a ground. I mean, th what they learned was a spirit, but that's not what, you know, I was hoping after doing the study and writing it, they would let me do some education sessions with the people who went to help debrief them, but they didn't want them to debrief because the things that really moved them were um, very threatening. It was solidarity that threatened them. But there's still, I mean, the district director here lost his election and the new district director has done virtually nothing to maintain that incredible uh, pathway of solidarity. And the issue of, uh, again, fascism, this is an issue in the front, front of everyone now with this coming election, uh, November election and the election for president. Yet in the unions, the, the AFL-CIO and Schuller, uh, apparently on Labor Day, that's not a concern to them of the rise of fascism. No, and it, neither is, is solidarity. And you have to ask yourself, uh, what do workers think, say in Chile, when the AFL comes down there and says, we are your supporters, we love you, uh, let's be in solidarity. And they look at them and say, you killed my father and grandfather. <laughs> I mean, so you can't build solidarity when you have been engaged in sabotage. And making the AFL say At least accountable. say you're sorry. At least say you did it. But they won't say they did it. Well, for workers in this country who are members of the AFL-CIO and want the AFL-CIO to be accountable, what, what can they do? What should they do? And uh, how can we say the AFL-CIO leadership uh, has to apologize and be held accountable for the thousands and thousands of workers, trades who were killed in uh, Chile uh, because directly, because of the role of the AFL-CIO working with the CIA in the overthrow of the Chilean coup? Most international unions are not going to allow that kind of education to go on through their vehicles. So, and a lot of labor studies programs are afraid to be too challenging because then they will disappear because they won't have labor support. It really is a wicked old boys network that functions underground to try and prevent certain things from getting talked about. How could the AFL-CIO say that reproductive rights is not a labor issue when it's one of the main factors that affects working women? That's crazy, that's stupid, that's ignorant and it's misogynist and Nobody in leadership wants to be called misogynist because they think they support women. They believe all the misinformation. I mean, we have such um, a decarmentalized minds at the leadership of our labor movement that they, uh, what they see over here never goes over here and they don't talk to each other. And so, um, this you know, disconnection, totally disconnected. Totally dis. What a fragmentation. This is the real alienation of our workers, is they're alienated from the knowledge of their actual conditions and what got them here. And, and you I as a, a academic, a historian, have actually been fighting in your own association, Labor History Association, to get them to confront the fact that they can't get access to the files of our unions about our own history, workers' history in this country. Yeah, no, the, the, you will, the, the amount of, it's, think of Biden as the head of the association. <laughs> I 
I mean, he talk about the association. What is the association we're talking about? Oh, we're talking about the Labor and Working Class History Association, where I did try to get a motion on the a resolution on the floor for the AFL to open their books in Falacha to make that demand. And it ended up with the person from the Solidarity Center and the one of the big wigs in Lacha saying, we'll work it out between us. And I found out later that she was the world's biggest collaborationist on many issues and uh, uh, an opportunist in other ways, but they just removed it by saying, we'll take care of it behind doors. And then after many emails saying, what's the result? What's the result? We finally got an email saying that um, they don't have the personnel sufficient to go through the files at this time. So they admitted that the files are being held secretly? Or what, what was the, what is that? What is that? <laughs> I don't know if I can still find that email. I'm sure it's in this computer somewhere. Um, Frank was part of a lot of that because I brought him and Rob to that meeting. You had a panel, in other words, at this association. We had a panel at it, and Soleil Thav and her friend, who's a filmmaker, filmed a lot of it. But I don't know if they ever filmed a plenary. So, but you did. You were able to have a panel at yeah. the conference. Yeah, we did, and um, that. It was, it introduced me to a fabulous guy from Illinois who was doing research on Afield and is still writing up wonderful short articles and pieces. But uh, I got into a big fight with the, one of the top leaders of the labor historians because he gave a paper on El Salvador and characterized the labor movement as anti as communist oriented because they were more radical. And when I said radical in El Salvador means you don't like US fruit, he really put me down. I don't remember the exact exchange, but he hasn't talked to me since. Because they- So he they was red baiting, he was red baiting the labor movement in El Salvador yeah. as, as well, communist. That's what they do. AFL-CIO's whole position vis-a-vis -vis labor in Latin America is that it's too communist and we have to get rid of the communists. And now with all these changes in Brazil and Bolivia, they're coming back. But what they mean is workers fighting for their rights are coming back. And when they fight for their rights, they hurt the US corporations that we work with here. So what kind of unionism is that when they say that they're worried about U.S. corporations in Chile and Latin America? Corporate. It's a, it's a form of fascism, actually. When the state, industry, and labor get together under the auspices of labor, I'm not labor, but under the auspices of the state or the corporations, that's when you start to, that was national syndicalism. It's what was being built in Germany when they brought the corporations you know, closer into the government. It, I don't know what to do about labor, um, but they are taking credit for Starbucks and um, these mass uprisings that are going on. And some unions are getting behind them and helping them, but they have no, they will not ever take responsibility for the damage they have done because they don't look at it as damage. They look at it as an important fight against the enemy. And Ruth, we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Chilean coup, what you've described as a, uh, a uh, massive terror. destruction, uh, uh, terror against the Chilean working class, which continues today with the privatization of social security, uh, the deregulation, full deregulation, privatization, destruction of pension systems, uh, health care, uh, devastation conditions for the Chilean working class, which are starting to happen in this country, uh, actually, with privatization, which Biden is supporting, privatization of Medicare, actually. Privatization, uh, uh, since the early, I would say, 1990, a privatization has been destroying the labor movement here. 
And too many people have ignored it because they haven't seen how the dots are connected. You could go to a peasant in Bolivia and say neoliberalism, and he'll look at you and say, that's right, deregulation, privatization, contracting out of jobs. You say neoliberalism in this country, and the people say, why? What's that? Neocon, liberal, social programs, what does it mean? They really don't know. There's an, and the, there will be no education from the labor movement on those kinds of, of issues. Because that means fighting the capitalist. Yes. And fighting the Democratic Party, which is imposing those policies. That's right. That which, means, well, mainly, what, I mean, the Democratic Party, if they say it, if Biden says this one more time, our part is to go out and vote. Bullpucky. Our part is to be in the streets and to make it impossible for these corporations to function, for the government to continue to support them. Our place is not in the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is kissing the Republicans who don't like Trump. I don't think it was idle speculation that Liz Cheney could end up being a vice presidential candidate. I mean, it's not going to happen, but I think it was it was put on the table. Yes. And so the lessons of Chile, as we've discussed in this um, interview, are relevant to the American working class. Absolutely. And in Chicago, they have a special meaning, not only in Chicago, but in Chicago, they have a special meaning. So I sit on the board of a little gallery in Pilsen, which is the Chicano uh, barrio in Chicago. And it's a, it's a, um, a place for political exhibits. It's called the Yuri Eichen Gallery, but they only show political. For example, the opening in this month at the gallery is a special presentation of photographs on the 43 disappeared Mexican students that has, that was all done through a black photographer from Chicago who went down there. And this is gonna be a fabulous exhibit. So the exhibits we're planning for the 50th anniversary are gonna begin early. We're gonna begin in May. And we want to highlight two very Chicago stories. One is the entire neoliberal economic system was thought up by Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago School of Economics. He worked with Harburg and some other people, and it is based on radical free market thinking, meaning no regulations, no government intervention, and complete employer control over the job market. Voila, they said, among themselves, you can't bring this into a country and impose it. There has to be something that sets that country into a total crisis. Chile, the coup was the perfect model. So they brought up a dozen Chilean economists to study at the University of Chicago. And there is a film that we'll be showing called Los Chicago Boys, photos of these people including the brother of the president before this one, um, learning neoliberalism at the lap of these fascists. And then they went down with them to Chile. They called it the brick. That was the name of the final. And they imposed it on a totally immobilized, crushed population. The guinea they, pig, the guinea pigs. To see if under those conditions. And guess what? It worked at first. They privatized social security, except for the military. They kept their private social security. And they started privatizing everything. They completely eliminated the trade union movement and created a union with, um, headed by a guy who would become Pinochet's ambassador to the United States. I mean, the, the crossovers are disgusting. They're just so horrible. 
all these A field people, all these CIA people. Um, it really um, got out of control. So um, remind me. So we're talking about the commemoration on the 50th anniversary. Yes. What is it going to so do in Chicago? I, I managed to find some people. Um, if I can get them more involved, it'll be great. But I have uh, a man named Mario who was a student leader in 1970, early 70s under the UP government at the Catholic University, which was the most reactionary. He was arrested, put in a concentration camp, tortured in, he was in three different concentration camps and then was exiled to Europe. Meanwhile, his father and two-year-old son were put into a concentration camp. He organized the resistance in Europe, but now lives in Chile and he's working on this. And he is in touch with the entire Chilean community in Chicago. He has Chile Amigos, he has all these organizations. Then I found, um, let me think of the main people. Uh, the people at the gallery will do the actual exposition. And um, there's a professor who just, a, a young man who just got a job at Notre Dame who live, used to live here. And he's gonna see if he can set up some teach-ins at Notre Dame. Um, Mario is gonna set up a teach-in with the human rights program at the University of Chicago. I plan to work with student groups and do a protest right in front of the School of Economics. And so I really wanna get jobs with justice and try and get some labor people down to help, but I also thought a nice program would be to maybe like go to the union hall for the teachers union and give a presentation on a field. Um, and what happened to education in Chile? What happened to education, teachers and education in Chile? Oh my God, so many people lost their jobs. Uh, they were blacklisted, so many teachers disappeared. I mean, the, the amount of exile disappeared and it's a generational trauma. My friend Soledad, her father was 12 years old when the coup happened. His father was a, um, a copper miner who was tortured, put in a concentration camp and then exiled to Canada. So he went with his father to Canada and his father, uh, had Soledad, not when he was 12, but when he was much older and Soledad was born into the exile community in Canada. The whole exile community everywhere in the world is in limbo still because they're Chilean, because their country was taken from them. And so I really want- And, and Soledad is an artist as well. Oh my God, she is a weaver. And she weaves with copper wire, the main export of Chile. And what she weaves is the face of the disappeared. She has a file on each person. She weaves their portrait. She weaves a huge tapestry. And what she did for her masters is cut up all the faces and hang them in a rotunda at different heights. So when you walked through the exhibit, you heard them talk because copper creates sound when you walk through it. But she's doing special exhibits at all the sites of memory in Chile for next year, but she will do an exhibit here. So the first exhibit we're gonna do is gonna focus on the popular unity government. People here don't even know what it was, people in Chile did not know what it was. Um, and of course, there's a fabulous film called Obstinate Memory that tells the story of the filmmaker who goes back to Chile with his Battle for Chile film and shows it to some students. But before he shows it to them, they are having a discussion, which he's filming on Allende and the UP in which most of them are saying things like, 
he was a dreamer. Uh, the coup was necessary. Uh, very few people were hurt. It brought peace to the country. And, you know, he didn't know what he was doing. I mean, it was all of this crap. And then they see two parts of the battle for Chile filmed during the uprising of the bourgeoisie. And when it, he shoots back at their faces, they're sobbing. There's men, young men, just sitting there and sobbing that they had been so misinformed, that they had known nothing. I think we should all be sobbing that we know so little about what our labor movement has done to workers in other parts of the world. Um, so this exhibit is gonna have three, three different exhibits that will change slightly. First one, posters from the UP government. They're beautiful, they're digitalized. It's not gonna cost us too many thousands of dollars to get them and put them up. For the second month, we'll keep them up but we'll put up some issues of NACLA exposing US intervention. We're hoping to have a Chilean economist come talk about neoliberalism. I will talk about A-Field and uh, I, will, I have a copy of the testimony I gave before the Senate that we can put up there. And, you know, things about the US imperialists, but by themselves, they don't make a very interesting exhibit. The second two months will be unbelievable. Uh, because Soledad will exhibit two major textiles she has just made on the faces of two Americans who were murdered during the coup. One from Chicago. His name was Frank Teruji. He was uh, very visible uh, in the movements. He would march with all the Chileans. And he worked with this group called FIEN, the source of North American information. Fiend was a newsletter that we put out with information about what US imperialism was doing and also information about the movements in the United States. Um, and we distributed it in Chile under Allende. That both people who were murdered worked with Fiend. And- And you, you yourself were nearly murdered. If you had yes, I worked for Fien as well, but I had to go very undercover in my work for Fien because I was actually working with the far right leadership, interviewing them, drinking wine with them uh, and finding out, I mean, the, it's hard to know what contributions I might've made. I went home after every dinner or wine and typed up everything the person said. And they, I, I typed it up and I made multiple carbon copies. I gave a copy to the UP. I gave a copy to the mirror. I, I sent a copy home and they all disappeared. I don't have a copy, but um, yeah, it was dangerous. I mean, I remember hearing the story not so long ago on the 40th anniversary, uh, there was a fabulous event in New York and through uh, the internet, they brought in the judges from Chile, England, and Spain who had together organized the arrest of Pinochet. I'm hoping to be able to show part of the proceedings because they were videotaped. Um, and we're bringing in a woman from Sweden who's Chilean, who was one of the main protesters in Chile. They were called Arpilleras. They made, they sewed little designs, pictures of things happening in Chile. And in the back, they sewed on a little pocket in which they put information on the resistance and gave it to tourists to take back. Uh, she doesn't have those, but she has done a new series on the, the current resistance in Chile that led to the recent election. She will come in and show her work and hopefully Soledad found a photographer who was at this mine that they recently found filled with corpses. And she did a photo essay on it. So the July and August will be stuff that has never been shown anywhere. We're hoping that Charlie's wife and Frank's sister will be there for the commemoration and that we can talk a little bit about what Fiend was and have, 
you know, a few copies of Fien on the wall so people can look at it and stuff like that. And then we want to dedicate the next month, September, to the new resistance. There's a film out now called La Primera, The First Line, which was made by Mario Sun. I think they showed it on the West Coast too. But it's about the first line of people that were defending the protesters um, against the government that led finally to the overthrow of the government. And there's also a fabulous short video called um, Las Tesis, the Theses. And it's an all woman march. I mean, huge women marching down the street, chanting, the rapist is you. <laughs> And it's a long poem that they wrote and it's so powerful. So we wanna show the emergence of this incredible resistance. We'll probably talk about the constitution. And we're also going to invite people from anywhere to contribute artwork based on all the themes that we've covered. So that the artwork, the main artwork for September, October will be current artwork submitted through a call that the gallery will make. So it should be, we hope to, um, one of the people on my team, uh, Ernesto, he's a filmmaker from Ecuador. He is actually going to try to film some interviews with Fiend people because they will not write anything. He also works at the Gene Siskel Film Center in Chicago. And he contacted them to see if they'd be interested in screening the new movie that's being, that was just released by Guzman. Turns out they are already scheduled to do it. And he wants to see if he can get them to show something in September of next year. We wanna show some of these, we have an incredible film repertoire. There's a film that most people have not seen uh, called Nai Pasaran, it's Norwegian. And there was a factory in Norway that made engines for the jet planes that Pinochet flew to bomb the Moneda. And after all the bombing, he needed new engines. And the workers in that factory refused to make them. And it tells their story. And it interviews them then and now, because there are few still alive. It is a story of solidarity better than anything I've ever seen. So we will definitely show that and maybe see if we can show it elsewhere. We wanna get some teachings going again um, so that we can really talk about Chicago's contribution to the coup and also Chicago's contribution to supporting um, the people's government. Well, I wanna thank you very much, Ruth, for joining us. I think we've had a, a wide ranging discussion <laughs> on the history <laughs> of the, the working history. class in Chile, the struggles there, and also the relevance today for the American working class and, and what dangers we face in the United States and our need really to learn the lessons of Chile to prepare ourselves for what's coming and what we're in. So thanks for joining us on Work Week. Absolutely. It's been a wonderful pleasure to talk about one of the most meaningful periods of my life.